uh, novel trend for industrial engineering and management. And uh, it is presented by Atma Jaya in collaboration with Yuan Che University. And thank you for taking time out being here today. And let me introduce myself a bit. My name is Bian Kalwisa and I just got graduated from Atma Jaya Catholic University in uh, Indonesia in June. And I'll be your moderator today. So if you guys want to know about international opportunities and also insightful information about AIoT, kindly stay tuned until the end of the event because I'm sure there will be um, exciting and insightful information for all of us. And we'll be running a live Q&A at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, kindly write in the chat box so then hesitate to ask away. And next, I want to uh, remind everyone about the rules. So the first one is kindly fill the registration form in the link given in the chat box. And then to please mute uh, my, uh, the microphone unless you are called on. And the third one is uh, kindly be attentive and active. You are allowed to put your questions in the chat box at any time. Okay, next, here's the rundown of the whole session. So the first one is the opening. And the second one is the information session. And after the information session, uh, there will be the Q&A. After that, there will be the general lecture about AIoT. And the next one is the Q&A again for the general lecture. After that, there will be a photo session. And uh, next, okay, now before we start the lecture, Please welcome our Head of Industrial Engineering Department, Mr. Yanto. Mr. Yanto, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bianca. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I am Dr. Yanto, the Head of Industrial Engineering Department, Faculty of Engineering uh, at Majaya Catholic University, Indonesia. I would like to welcome our international speaker from Yuanzhe University, Taiwan. Uh, the first one, Professor Liang from Yuanzhe University. Hello, Professor Liang. Hello, nice to Hi, meet you. Uh, Dr. Yang Tong. Uh, uh, yes. uh, good afternoon. Times, uh, we met a few times in the last two weeks. Yeah? Yes. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for your coming today. Uh, you are very and welcome. second one, Mr. Dipta Pius Purwadaria from uh, Yuanze University. Hello, Mr. Dipta. Hello, guys. Good afternoon. Okay. Uh, from your name, uh, you must be from Indonesia, right? Yes, I'm from Indonesia. So if you guys want to ask me in Indonesian language, I will likely to answer you guys too. Don't worry about it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dipta. You're welcome. And the <laughs> third one, Mr. Nguyen Min Dui from Yuanze University. Hello, Mr. Nguyen. Hello? Oh, uh, it's okay. I think from Vietnam, right? So for all our speaker, I would like to express our uh, thank you, gratitude and deeply appreciation for your coming today to give a lecture in our uh, workshop or international general lecture. So I would also like to express my gratitude and appreciation to Dr. Ronald as the PIC of uh, this event and his team also for their preparation. Uh, and also I would like to say thank you to our former student, Ms. Bianca, who will be the moderator uh, in our uh, general lecture today. So we also welcome all the participants today, uh, the teacher, lecturer, uh, students and all participants uh, for your coming today. Is this uh, international general lecture held by our department with topics AIoT uh, data driven analysis and novel trend for industrial engineering management? The international general lecture organized by our department has been held uh, a few times, and I hope uh, there will be more and more in the future as our commitment to provide international knowledge and insight to our students. So I hope that we can, uh, we all can learn a lot from our event today uh, presented by our speaker. So have a nice lecture. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Miss Bianca. <coughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yanto, for your uh, welcoming speech. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speakers. Okay, the first one is Professor Yun Chia Liang, uh, which is the professor and chair at Yonche University in Department of Industrial Engineering and Management. And he got his PhD in Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering in Auburn University. He is also the director of Operation Research and Society of Taiwan and the Vice Director for a Research Center and um, Smart Production and Innovative Management. And his lab is Global Logistic and Innovative Optimization. And he will introduce the department, also giving lecture about his previous research about IoT. And the next one, we have Mr. Deep Tadi Pakara Pius Purwadarya, which is the Master Program Student of Information and Communication. And also we have Mr. Nguyen, uh, which is the English Bachelor's Program Student of Management. And they will be uh, introducing the white is at you to all of us. And all right, now after introducing our speakers, we can start the information session. And after that, there will be the Q&A session. So Professor Liang, uh, Mr. Dipta, and Mr. Nguyen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we will start from the uh, introduction of the YCU. Uh, so today we will have two students uh, will introduce the y uh, UNC University. Uh, so, uh, Dipta? Uh, okay, Professor. Uh, yeah, could you, could you please, uh, yeah, yeah, I see you okay. there. Yeah, so could you Thanks please run the introduction? Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, right before I'm starting, all the participants is Indonesian, right? So it's okay if I'm using Indonesian language in here, or do you prefer if I talk in English, guys? Uh, I think we have some attendance from Vietnam as well. Ah, okay. That's as, I, as I understand. Yeah, okay, so probably English will be better. Yeah. Okay, Professor, I will talk in English. Thank then. you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me share my screen first. Okay. So you guys can look at my screen, right? Okay. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'm Dipta, uh, a master student here in Yuanzi University in Department of Information Communication. Right now, I'm in the second year of my study, and I'm happy right now to introduce a little bit about YZU to all of you. Uh, it's just going to be a small introduction or small brief about YZU, and I hope you guys will find it interesting and give you like more motivation to keep continuing your study or pursuing your research later on. Okay, so uh, what I will talk is more like the historical, the quick facts, location, award features, the college and departments that wise you have in here, the research center, the prospectus or like pamphlet or booklet, scholarship, international and exchange, how the life in campus and what people usually will ask, what will you get after you graduate in here? First of all, as you know that uh, YZU uh, established uh, by the founder of Eastern, uh, Far Eastern Group, Mr. Su in 1989, with the name of Yuanzhou Institute of Technology and it changed later on in 1997 with the name of Yuanzhou University. As we know, Far Eastern Group itself is quite a big uh, industry here in Taiwan with a lot of like uh, sister corporation here. As you can see in the slide that they have a lot of business like in transportation, telecommunication, banking, construction, energy fields, philanthropies, retails, and synthetic fibers. It was established in 1949 with 
total assets more than 82 billion US dollar and revenue around like 21 billion US dollar each year and they have like uh, the number of employees around 58,000 employees right now more than that i think and they have like more than 249 sister companies or small companies okay in yonsei itself or in yzu we have like 8739 student with 18.1% graduate student right now in its uh, uh, in yzu itself we have like uh five college and 24 uh, yeah five college and 24 department and it was really big in here and as you can know uh the student some of them or 10% of the student in here are international student so don't worry if you are going to joining this campus you will find a lot of foreigner and the local student itself want to talk in english too okay the location of this yzu is really nearby or reachable to any kind of city or a big city in taiwan as you may see in the slides that just to go to the airport is only take around 25 minutes and if you want to go to taipei it will only take like 40 minutes going to the train station from our campus only take 15 minutes going to the like uh high speed rail train is only take 40 minutes per hour, around that much and from my own experience by living here in Yuanzhou University or in nearby YZU, uh, it's really comfortable for me to stay in here or if I want to go from one city to the other city, it's really easy. And the people in here is quite warm and even I can't speak Chinese, they will want to help me a lot and they are quite friendly. Even the student, even the local people are really friendly. Next, uh, as you know, YZU has a, or have a high reputation itself. You may see in here that YZU recognized us in 2020 itself, recognized as top 15 university in Taiwan. In, uh, 2005 become 12 top university uh, getting the 12 top university award and award teaching excellence grant for 12 years so it's quite a good track for the if you want to choose a good uh, university to study on and then as you can see in here its department has their own rank actually and maybe because we are talking more about engineering in here in 2020, the engineering and technology get in the rank, uh, the, in the academic ranking of World University in the number of 801. Okay. The quality teaching itself have a lot of accreditation in uh, our campus. So you can see that we get the AACSB accreditation. We got the accreditation of Chinese Collegiate School of Business too. We got the IWET accreditation too. So for sure, the quality to pursue your study in here is really good. What we offer in here uh, that YZU itself is the first building world university here in Taiwan. So you don't need to worry that the people or all the staff and the teacher itself will help you even you can or can't speak English. And YZU is uh, the first university to implement five-year dual degree system. So if you want to take the uh, dual degree system or you want to take like your bachelor, but I believe some of you is already a bachelor student. So maybe if you want to take your master, you can try to apply to here. So, and then programming language is a required course in here so the main point in here from my own experience that almost in every department they will teach you or require you to understand a little bit about 
programming language or you need to know about it so it's a good a chance for you guys because right now maybe the world in this era and generation we really need to know about these things okay no division of departments in college of management and college of electrical and communication engineering and for some undergraduate uh, student later on they will allow 15 percent department transfer in the sophomore year so if you trying to get the bachelor degree again later on here in YZU, if you and you want to change your uh, department later on they will giving you the chance to change the department too and they have the interdisciplinary programs too in here what are the five college that we have in here the first college that we have is electrical and communication engineering the second one is department of informatics or college of informatics uh, the next one is the part uh, college of engineering the next one College of Management, and the last one is College of Humanities and Social Science. And inside its college, they have more than 24 departments itself with English program. Mm. Okay. As you can see in here, in College of Engineering or Electrical Engineering, they have uh, the Department of Electrical Engineering, Group A, Electrical, Group B, Communication, Group C, Botanics. And both of the, the uh, all the departments have bachelor degree, master, and a doctoral degree. And the last one is the for the international student who want to take the undergraduate, is the International Program in Electrical and Communication Engineering for Bachelor. With the key development of area is IoT and its application or implementation, AI, and intelligent biomedical. In College of Informatics, we have uh, five uh, offering to you guys, where we have the Department of Computer Science Engineering, Department of Information Management, Department of Information Communication, Graduate Program in Biomedical Informatics, and last one, International Program in Information for Bachelor. With the K development of area, core technology of big data, IoT and intelligent living, interactive technology and digital content design, biomedical informatics, social media innovative service. As you can see in here, uh, only in biomedical informatics that we don't have the bachelor degree. So only in here, if you want to find or learn more about biomedical, you need to take only the graduate degree in here or master degree. Okay. The next one is the I am or uh, College of Engineering, where they offer you inside there is a Department of Mechanical Engineering, Department of Chemical Engineering, Engineering and Material Science, Department of Industrial Engineering and Management, Graduate School of Biotechnology and Bioengineering, and the last one, International Program in Engineering for Bachelor. As you can see in the other side, the key development area is material development and application-oriented energy technology, product design-oriented biotechnology, customer demands and digital content-oriented elderly welfare technology, action management-oriented via cloud-based, and the last one, smart manufacturing-oriented via system integration and application. The next one is College of Management, where you can find in here uh, this kind of offer where you can learn or if you really interest in Bachelor of Business Administration program, English Bachelor of Business Administration program, MBA program, Master of Science in Finance and Accounting, Global Master of Business Administration program, and Doctor of Philosophy program. So <laughs> if you talk uh, college of management you will learn more about innovation and entrepreneurship in this IO, era of iot corporate governance and risk management leadership development and occupational competency with chinese characteristic global market and international strategy in digital economy o2o marketing trends and accounting information and policy decision <coughs> and the last one is the 
uh, humanity and social science where you can find department of foreign language and applied linguistics department of Czech linguistics and literature department of social and policy science department of art and design and the next for the phd they have doctor of philosophy in cultural industry and cultural policy and for the bachelor they have the english bachelor of strategic communication with the focus area of crossfield digital cultural creation promote community community practice and local culture study art design and management asia pacific chinese literature and culture social welfare and long term care system in here uh, in YZU itself after we know about all the college and department as you can see before we have the uh, the focus in the research center itself is around these things that you can see or so in your own uh, monitor where we focus more on big data and digital convergence center communication research center fuel cell or green technology center Jiren Technology Research Center, Environmental Technology Research Center, <coughs> Smart Production and Innovative Management Research SPIM Center, Management Competency Development and Research Center, NII Innovation Center. So if you can, if you find something interesting in here and you want to pursue the research more, you can try to join us. In here, if you want, you can scan the QR code and you will get directly into our uh, booklet or pamphlet uh, that you can find more about us inside this uh, booklet or pamphlet. If you want, you can try to scan it right now. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay. The next thing that I will talk is about our scholarship. In here, we have uh, have different scholarship depending on the degree that you pursue. If you're trying to get the bachelor degree, you will only get the scholarship intuition waiver, and it will be around 20 to 100 percent tuition waiver. And if you want to take master degree, you will get a tuition waiver from around 20 to 100, and you get the chance to get the stipend, which. Uh, the stipend itself for the master student will be around 6,000 entities per month, or maybe if I can calculate in Indonesian around 3.1 or 3.2 million rupees. <clears throat> and for the PhD student, you will get a tuition waiver for 100% for sure. And the stipend for 8,000 entities per month, it's around like 4 or 4.1 million rupees and you get the chance to become a research assistant salary and the salary will it depends on the advisor itself but actually in master student if you are quite good and your you can show to your professor that you have the ability because in my experience i get the chance to become a research assistant too here as a master student you will get a salary as a master student uh, by joining the lab or the uh, professor's lab. So you still will still get a chance to get uh, some extra money from your own professor later on, even you are a master student. And there is another way to get some extra financially, like you can become the TA or teaching assistant later on. As you can see in here, this is the graphic where the, the growth of international students here in Yuanzi University is keep growing from year to year. And right now we have uh, like the international students already more than 10% of the total student here in Yuanzi University, where all the students coming from more than 50 countries inside it. Okay. <clears throat> And we have a lot of uh, connection with the other university too, with, where we have in 2019 active partnership with 251 universities uh, worldwide and 27 dual degree programs worldwide too. So if I'm not wrong too, that's 
uh, in Indonesia there is some university that has a connection with uh, Yonsei University itself. <coughs> Yonsei University. Right now we are going we are going to talking more about the campus. As you can see, this is all the six building uh, that we have in campus. Actually, there is two more building where the other building is the student building and the number eight is the uh, dormitory or student dormitory. Uh, as you can see, there is no building number four in here as uh, in Taiwan or like in Japan, number four is maybe uh, not a good sign or it can be, or it has a meaning like a death. So it, you will like rare to find a building with number four. And the building number one is College of Informatics or the headquarters of College of Informatics. Building two, the headquarters of College of Engineering. Building three, College of Technical Engineering and Department of Art and Design. Building five, College of Humanities and Social Science. Building six, College of Management. And building seven, College of Electronical and Communication Engineering. And myself, uh, I stayed in building five. Even I'm actually a student from build, uh, College of Informatics, but my lab is in building five. Okay. In here, in YCU, we offer you a lot of things too. Not only uh, the, the study place, the lab and everything, but we have like Olympic size running track. So for someone who really think or really care about your healthiness, Will you can enjoy and join this kind of uh, feature that we have. We have indoor swimming pool, fitness center, library. This is one of the best library to in the town. Dormitory and cafeteria. So it's really comfortable for you, and it's really easy to, for you to find food and everything. For the international student, we have a lot of things like the global hub or the student lounge, the international student lounge. So if you want to like chit chat or talking with your friends and going with your friends, you can use this room. And we have prayer room or musola in Indonesia. We have body program. So you can make friends with your, the local and the other foreigners. Football club, holy festival celebration. Is this actually like the color festival? but the Indian version, <clears throat> the Muslim culture day. Sometimes we celebrate like uh, Lebaran or Idul Adha too. And we have mid autumn barbecue party. And the last one, and I found is the really interesting festival is the International Food Festival where its uh, country will try to cook and to represent uh, their country by using this food. And as you may know Indonesian usually will just bring Indomie and Bakwan to the floor. <clears throat> and in the courses itself, we have uh, the support infrastructure, infrastructure like this, as you can see in the picture, where we have a lot of things that you can use. Like if you have uh, in, interest in VR, AR, we have the tools to, for you to build it up. We have a lot of things that you can find and the professor will help you to, to find the right tools for your own research. Next thing, this is the picture where you can get the image of our dormitory. In our dormitory, we separate between boy and girls. So don't think that we are going to mix you guys up now. So boy will have their own place and girls will have their own place where in each room, there are going to be four people living together. And as you can see right in here, in the top side, uh, there is your room with air conditioner and everything. And the next photo you can see, you will get the facility of wash machine, uh, refrigerator, and everything. And you have will have a lounge to in dormitory. And there is going to be a convenience store too in the dormitory. And as you can see, this is the view of the dormitory. Okay. And around the campus, if you don't think you are uh, the food in cafeteria suitable for you, uh, don't worry. You can 
around the campus there is a lot of restaurant and uh, like small uh, food and beverage business that you can try and it's quite easy to find a halal food in here too so no need to worry to find a halal food and from this picture i personally recommend if you come to here to try this waffle this is the most iconic things that you need to try if you want to come to taiwan especially to YZU. <clears throat> after YZU or after graduate what will you guys have uh, from my own experience and from a lot of storytelling from the other who are who are already graduate uh, YZU itself is already a private university that most like by corporation so some of them uh, like 90% of them will get job in three months and 96% of them will get job in the six months so if you want or if you're willing to work in Taiwan make sure you learn the language and you will get the chance for sure <clears throat> and the career information itself the uh YZU itself offer a lot of internship and opportunities for you to visit different uh, companies under the Far Eastern group. Me, myself, uh, got the chance from my professor to, uh, to joining some of the, or visiting some of the companies under the Far Eastern group too. So it's quite interesting and really a good experience for us, like to see how they work, how the real things work in here. And for the internship itself, they offering the Far Eastern AB program, where the A is program seven months care cultivation internship and B two months summer internship. So you can choose between you want to do it. because if I'm not wrong, uh, the undergraduate student usually need to have internship phase. So they will joining this kind of internship uh, or choose this kind of internship program. But for the master and PhD. Sometimes, if only you have projects with the company, you will joining the internship. If not, maybe it depends on your own courses or classes to join uh, to visiting the company. <clears throat> so, if you guys are interested to joining us and you think like it's a good thing to join us, uh, here is the application period that you can try. Usually on the fall semester, we will open the submission on 1st March until 15 April. And for the spring semester, usually we will open it on 1st September up till 15 October, if I'm not wrong. You can try to scan the QR code for the online application system. And for the upcoming semester is the spring semester. It will be open on the 1st September. So if you guys really want, to try to come here and to join us here in YZU. Don't forget on 1st September to submit your application and try to prepare starting from now on. <clears throat> here, if you want to know more about the YZU, you can try to find us here in Facebook, in YZU Global Affairs Office, or in IG, YZU Gao, GAO or you can email us in this uh, email. And right in the website of uh, Global Affairs Office itself, if you want to know more about the YZU, you can try to chat one of the students that already joining uh, the GAO as the Global Student Association, and you can try to ask more about the YZU from, uh, to them and knowing more from them. Uh, wait a second, I think I have. Okay. I think that's some of the information that I can give to you. The like important uh, information that I can give to you. For me myself, the experience while studying in here is quite wow. It's really wonderful for me actually to give get this kind of chance like getting the scholarship and everything and getting the chance to helping the jo and the professor too so for me myself it's 
like I really like recommend you guys to try uh, to get more uh, experience outside of your own country and try to pursue more what you want in your research. And I hope all the best for you guys. And if you guys have questions or anything, you can ask me now. I think that's all from. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dipta. That is really insightful. And uh, maybe we can skip the first Q&A session and gather the inquiries later in the last session, all right? And before the general lecture, uh, let's have the photo session first. Um, so I'm welcoming all dear participants to open your camera. Okay, the photo session will be um, will be documented by Mr. Ronald. So, um, okay, now that everyone is opening their camera, maybe we can start the photo session. Okay, I will count first. So, one, two, three. Okay, is it already documented, Mr. Ronald? Okay, okay. All right. Um, therefore, um, the photo session is done. And after this, we can start the general lecture. And after that, there will be a QA and a session. So don't forget to uh, ask away if you have any inquiries. And um, Professor Yang, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Bianca. So I will share my screen for the PPT. Okay, so can you see my screen over here? Yes, yes, it's already visible. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, particularly thanks uh, to uh, Professor Arona's invitation. Uh, so it's my pleasure to, uh, to share um, the some we will say some information about my personal uh, research and also to introduce the uh, IEM department at YCU. Okay, so if you have any question, feel free to, to ask me, or you can wait until the Q and A session. So from the title, as we can see over here, I try to give a name like a AIoT data driven analysis. Uh, I think this is become a very important term because the, they combine the AI with the IoT. And we know we have a quite important things to analyze for all the industrial engineering student uh, or the faculty member. Uh, we would like to collect the data from the different field, from the manufacturing factory, from the service industry, from the hospital, et cetera then how can we try to embed those like important or the modern technology for our analysis? So I would like to share with you uh, for particularly for the, from the aspect of the industrial engineering and management. Um, I will quickly talk about just my background. Uh, I know that Ms. Uh, Bianca already talked about my uh, education and also some uh, professional experience background. Um, Actually, I have the background in both mechanical engineering and also the industrial engineering. I have the bachelor and also one master's degree in mechanical engineering. 
and all my graduates uh, study uh, are in, were in the United States. So you can see I have the degree from three different universities in the United States, Carnegie Mellon. And then for the IE part, I have the degree from the University of Pittsburgh. And finally, the, my PhD uh, was from the Auburn University. And also I have the chance to uh, involved in some academic uh, activity. Some of them in the uh, Taiwan, we will say the Ministry of Science and uh, Technology. And some of them actually involved with the IEEE uh, Computational Intelligence Society. And also I have some experience with the uh, Operations Research Society in Taiwan as well. Okay, so here is my contact information. So after the seminar, if you have any question, you also please feel free to contact me. So first thing I would like to mention will be my uh, research interest. Um, basically, uh, I divide it into two parts. One is the meta heuristic. Uh, I believe the, the student, the attendant, most of the attendant have the background in industrial engineering. So you probably have the taken the courses such as the operations research. And the meta heuristic can be considered as one part of the operations research. So that will be different kind of algorithm for the optimization problem. So the meta heuristic, we can apply to different field, such as the scheduling, logistic, uh, supply chain management, resource allocation, system design, image processing, et cetera. As long as you can formulate the problem in the form of the optimization, you have the objective, you have the constraint, et cetera. So that's one of my major research interests I will share with you today. And the second part is so-called artificial intelligence. So if you remember from my title of the speech today, I have a name of the AIOT. So AI actually coming from the artificial intelligence. So recently, uh, actually I have conducted some research using either the deep learning or the machine learning. Uh, I will show you two, uh, we will say uh, practical project over here. One is related to the small agriculture. So that means we try to apply those AI technique and after we collect the data, we send through the like IoT device, then we try to analyze them. So the first thing for the small agriculture, that will be trying to detect the uh, defect beans, the coffee bean. The second one is for the like infant or the baby crying recognition. I will share with you uh, with some of the um, outcome we get. So for the meta heuristic, I would like to share with you two methods. The first method is the virus optimization algorithm. We know that the term of the virus is kind of like the sensitive for um, most of the people in the, in the world right now because we actually, lots of people are suffering for this kind of virus. Uh, actually, we, and I and my student, we got an idea, try to simulate uh, the behavior of the virus, how they attach the cell. So we turn it into the optimization algorithm. We start the research back to around like 10 years ago. Then we develop, successfully develop as an optimization algorithm, quite interesting. So using this, we try to solve the different kind of, uh, some of them are the real problem, such as the image segmentation, power distribution, okay? And also for the algorithm, we do have lots of so-called parameter we have to tune in. So we also develop a self-adapted uh, algorithm. So we can actually let the uh, algorithm itself to decide the parameter value. We actually got the published on the soft computing, one of the SCI journal. And so for the image segmentation, uh, I will have some results to show you quite interesting as well. We try to do that for the uh, determine the threshold for the image, okay? Then we actually develop an uh, automatic, uh, we will say the procedure to determine that. 
Another thing is the power distribution. So that means this is quite practical things as well. So that means we are able to determine the, uh, we will say the demand for each uh, generator. And so by doing that, we hope that we can optimize the economic. So that means the generation cost. And also we consider the environmental factor. So that means we try to minimize the emission, the air pollution as well. So that become the bi-objective uh, optimization problem. We also try to apply the VOA. We got published in another SCI journal, and I will show you some of the results from this part as well. And also, um, for myself, uh, I actually got the two time like the MOST, like Outstanding Young Scholar Project uh, by proposing the virus optimization and its application. So that actually the two project, I got around five year project span. And actually that's quite honor to, to get it. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce some detail about the virus optimization algorithm, okay? So as I mentioned, the virus, they try to find out the core of your cell, okay, your glios. So that means if the virus, they try to attack the cell, then once they find out the, the core, then that means the this, this cell basically will die. And that will be the ultimate goal for those viruses. So we turn into this kind of behavior into the optimization method. So on the right hand side, you can see the illustration of this, like the cell on the top. And on the bottom, this is the illustration of our virus optimization algorithm. So from here, you can consider the yellow region can be considered more like the region contain all the feasible solutions for your optimization problem. And over here, we have a nucleus that would represent your optimal solution uh, close to the button border. And then you can see some white dot over the black dot over here. Those are considered as the viruses, okay? And you can see some like a small dot over here. So that means we just try to demo how they generate, those viruses will generate or replicate to produce more viruses. We know the viruses actually, they will replicate and try to produce more so they can actually attack uh, the cell in a different direction. So this is what happened, but you probably also notice that we have two different kinds of dot. One is the white dot, okay, with the bigger circle and we have uh, the black dot. And the white dot, basically we have two, we will divide the viruses into two category. One is so-called the strong viruses and the black one will become the common one. So for the optimization problem, it's actually quite easy to define that. So that will be based on their objective function value. For those better one, we consider they are strong viruses. And for those one with the worst uh, objective function value, then they will be considered as the common viruses. And also you can see when we try to produce the new viruses, it looks like the behavior of generating the new viruses for strong viruses and for the common viruses are slightly different. Yes, because they have a different behavior. Those good viruses, strong viruses can be considered they are located in those good region. So we will enhance the search around them, not too far away from them. But for those common viruses, we will give them more freedom to explore the entire region. So you can see the new viruses could be a little bit far away from the original viruses. Okay, so that's the things for our virus optimization algorithm. And now I'm going to introduce some of the, uh, we will say the research outcome. For example, we try to investigate so-called the benchmark function. 
the benchmark function could be the continuous function like this. And some of them we use like two dimension or three dimension to show you what's their contour, okay? So for example, one famous uh, benchmark function like Sphere, Ackley, Rosenbrock, uh, those kind of thing you can see they have a different kind of behavior. For example, the Sphere, they are considered, they have a global minimum, okay? And with the ship like this one, but if you look at the one for the Ackley or for the Schwefel on the right-hand side, you can see they also consider the uh, minimization problem, but you can see they have lots of like a peak and valleys. So that means they have lots of local minima. So it makes the function more complicated to optimize. So we try the different kind of optimization for our research. Okay, so this is just try to show you from one of our outcome. Actually for those benchmark uh, instance, we also try to add different factor. We provide a shifted factor, rotation factor, or both factor to be added into our benchmark at the same time. And the things you are seeing right now, this one just more like convergence behavior. So that means along with your, our search procedure, we can see, we can, we tend to find the optimal solution because the, and so the arrow actually gets uh, slower and uh, actually lower and lower like this. So that means for our algorithm, the BOA actually is very robust. It doesn't matter what kind of like a noise factor has been added into our benchmark function. We can all perform, uh, try to identify the global optimal, okay, in a similar uh, speed. So that's actually one uh, interesting thing to know. Another thing I would like to demonstrate to you is like uh, how we can see they will converge to the optimal solution. So in this case, you can see that from the left on the top you, over here, you can see the red drop over here. This can be considered more like a, um, initial generation. We have the virus spread out over here. And the optimal solution for this uh, demonstration should be uh, when x equal to zero, and y equal to zero, so right at the center over here, okay? So using those red jobs, we are able to generate lots of new viruses like blue job over here, okay? And after we apply so-called antivirus, delay some of the bad virus, then we actually keep some of the population like this. So we can see that getting closer to the optimal solution, okay? So we keep doing something like this for the several other uh, iterations. So on the right-hand side, actually, this is the demo. For example, maybe after like 10 iteration, 10 generation, then we can see we are getting more closer to this uh, optimal solution, even closer. If we try to enlarge those population, you will see they become very, very close to the global optimal. So this is actually just trying to demonstrate the convergence behavior of our algorithm. And the next application I would like to quickly show you is for the image segmentation. So that means uh, we have a two picture over here. On the left hand side, this is a Ringo paper. So you can consider this is the original one. So the purpose is try to identify the wording, the words on this wrinkle paper. We know after the wrinkle, you can see the background that sometimes they, the color become pretty dark. So it will be difficult to, to read the words, to identify the words. So you have a background, you have the foreground, the object, okay? So we try to use the, uh, the thresholding, so-called image segment, segmentation technique uh, combined with the meta heuristic to do it. And this kind of problem actually in the traditional approach, they have a difficult way to find out the proper number of the thresholding. 
So that means on the right hand side, you can see that that's their grade label image, the histogram. And so the, the red curve over here, that's the original, we will say the histogram for this particular wrinkle paper image. And we try to find out how many cut we can do. So basically we find out probably we have one pick at the low grade level and we have uh, several picks in the higher grade label. So later on we decide to have like two. So how many threshold that become a big issue? So in our research, we actually are able to develop a automatic procedure to determine the proper or the optimal number of the threshold in order to find out, to identify the object successfully. So this is something we try to show you. At that time, we actually, besides the BOA, we also try to use like a GA, PSO to do it. And BOA actually provide pretty promising result. This is another uh, image we try to do. Uh, if you have the experience on the image uh, processing or the image segmentation, I believe that you have definitely have seen this one before. So this one actually is considered as the Lena, -E a very like famous lady in the image segmentation test. Okay, so again, we try to use the VOA and we try to use the GA PSO to do it. And actually the result over here, you can see the VLA, we only need this kind of computational time on the right column over here, 0.55, okay? Less than one second to get those kind of results. Uh, GA and the PSO, they actually perform similarly, but from the image over here, if you try to look at, you can find out, for example, the photo, from the, the second photo from the right-hand side, this one actually lose some of the detail. So if you try to take a close look, you will find out the second photo from the left-hand side probably will perform, provide more detail compared to the other two. And this is the outcome of our VOA. Okay, we actually can successfully get the characteristic of those image. So this is another outcome I would like to show you. Then the next one is the outcome for the, the demonstration for the power distribution problem. So in this case, I'm just trying to show you that one, like a famous uh, benchmark system, the IEEE 30 buses and six generator system. So over here, you can look at this in this illustration. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. So that means you have six generator. They have different kind of capacity and we have like a different number of customer. We have to satisfy each customer. They have different number of demand we need to satisfy. And each generator, they have different kind of, uh, we will say generation cost. And also they have a different emission and that will be actually air pollution. So we have to determine uh, the generation for each generator. Okay, so over here, I just quickly to show you the, our result. Um, we try to use this one, our BOA, and to combine with the GA, PSO, and Harmony Search, other famous meta heuristic. And I'm trying to show you the box plot over here. And remember, we have two different kind of objective. On the left-hand side, the box plot on the left-hand side, this is for the uh, generation cost, so-called economic cost. On the right-hand side, this box plot is trying to show you the emission cost. So that related to the air pollution. So over here, both of them are the minimization problem. So you can see the box plot of the BOA performed pretty good. Okay, for example, for the ED, for the economic cost, basically we have a lower value and also the variation is much smaller than other three methods. Okay, and similarly for the uh, emission cost, the BOA actually has the lowest value 
on average as well. Okay, so this is quite interesting to know. And if you look at the table over here, besides the number we obtained, you can also look at the CPU time on the right column over here. So that means how much time we need to get those solution. So you can see that for the VLA, the first one, the average is the 7.8 second, okay? And other meta heuristics, they perform similarly around like a second. And the last one, the 927 second, this is actually obtained by the uh, optimization software. So you can see the advantage of those meta heuristic. They are able to get a very good result within much shorter computational time, okay? The second method I would like to talk about is another meta heuristic, the so-called the end colony optimization. This is actually one of the methods I, I use in my PhD dissertation. Um, but after I joined the YZU, I continue to direct uh, some master or the PhD student to apply the ACO to different kind of optimization method. So over here, I, for example, we have the system design, okay, for the redundancy allocation problem. Uh, we have the parallel series parallel system, and we try to do it. This one actually, we I published this paper with my PhD uh, advisor. Uh, we published this one in the IEEE Transaction Nine Reliability, and our citation. As I remember in Google Scholar has been over 400. I think right now probably close to approaching 450 to 500, okay, highly cited paper. Another one we actually apply is for the scheduling problem, okay? So for this one, we actually have two kinds of scheduling problem. One is for the online scheduling problem. So that means for the e-commerce, you definitely have the experience to order something through the website, through the internet. So you know that sometimes you are able, for some of the company, you are able to customize your product. When you are able to customize your product, so that means for the company, they have to determine how and when to uh, assemble your product and so that they can respond to you that when they can deliver the product to you okay this actually this kind of scenario coming from one of the uh, computer company in united states dell okay so that means the customer once they put the order through the internet they are waiting for the response from the company to let them know that when they can receive the product so that means within probably like one or two seconds, the company need to make decision and inform the customer waiting on another side of the computer. Okay, so this is quite challenging and quite interesting problem. We actually also solve it and publish one of, in one of the SCI journal. And another one is for the uh, multi-objective scheduling. So that means we try to consider not just one objective. We may try to optimize the different goal. So that's why we actually demo. We try to collect the data from one of the uh, big company in Taiwan in uh, printed circuit board, the PCB industry. So we have the real data for this one, okay? For the end colony optimization, if you look at the name, let me go back to the previous one, the end colony. So basically, similar to the virus optimization, we try to simulate the behavior of the ends and what kind of behavior of the end. For the VLA, we try to simulate the behavior of the attraction. And the end colony, we try to simulate the behavior of their searching the food. So a famous experiment over here, the double bridge experiment. So that means uh, the scientists find out that the uh, ants, they can communicate with each other using a chemical substance, so-called the pheromone. So that means when they visit some path, they will deposit the pheromone on the trail. 
So the following ends when they get to the like uh, junction over here, they will choose the path. Probably one of the reason based on the intensity of the pheromone on the trail. So the double bridge experiment is a control experiment. So that means we only have two paths from the starting point to, we can consider more like a dessert, the food, okay? So at the beginning of the experiment, if we put two ends uh, at the starting point over here, one using the blue icon, another one use the pink one. So that means both paths, they are clean, okay? And the length of the, this path, uh, the longer one actually is double of the shorter one. So that means for this two, the first two ends, when they got here, they have no idea which one is better, okay? So they probably have the 50% of the chance to choose each of the path. So if we assume one choose the shorter one, another one choose the longer one, okay? If they are traveling using the same, same kind of speed, then we will see the end who choose the shorter path uh, just arrive on the foot, but the, the end choose the longer path actually is still the halfway. So after the, the end choose the shorter path return to the starting node, then this one just arrive. So what does that mean? If today we have more ends coming, when they see this two path, the intensity of the pheromone will be different. The shorter one will be double of another one, okay? So that means uh, accumulate those kind of pheromone. Later on, the shorter path actually will attract more ants. So that means this one probably will become a better option compared to another, okay? So this is what uh, we call the ACO. The, they try to simulate the behavior of the um, ant searching for the food. So over here, I would like to show you one thing, um, so-called the bi-objective uh, scheduling problem. And this one, as I mentioned, is from the PCB company. So they have lots of like parallel machine, okay? And the two objective they try to optimize is the try to minimize the maximum completion time. And another one is try to minimize the total tartness. So we try to do that one. And we got some of the outcome like this. And that's why we try to compare our ACO. You can see the, we will say the uh, dot over here, the brown one, the brown dot. And we compare with those famous um, by objective uh, method, such as the SPGA, MOGA, NSGA2, et cetera. Okay, and this is actually the, the outcome has been demonstrated using the Pareto front. So that means for the minimization problem, we expect that if we can find a solution close to the origin over here, that will be better. Zero, zero over here, that will be better. So from here, you can see that the solution provided by the ACO, they have pretty good tendency to do that. And you probably will be wondering then what does that mean we have those blue one? It looks like even better than the end colony one. This actually uh, is more like a reference, more like an optimal solution. By using this, we have to run the algorithm for much, much longer time to get those like a comparison, uh, we will say ground, okay? But to for the ACO or other method, we actually can save lots of computational effort to get the satisfy, uh, we will say, a result for this particular application. So this is the outcome I would like to show you for the second thing. Then the next one, I'm, uh, we, I will start to look at the application of the small agricultural, okay? So for this one, I'm showing you so-called the small coffee bean selector. And the things you are seeing over here is the prototype system in my lab. And so for this one, we actually build up everything on our own. And so the purple things you are seeing over here, that's uh, we actually 
uh, plotted and also printed out using the 3D printer. Okay, so this one, uh, you can see we have a feeding component. So that means we can jump the coffee bean on top of the feeding component. Then they will slide down to on the conveyor. On the conveyor, the second thing we have is the aligning component. So that means by shaking this, those uh, beans, we are able to separate them. Okay, so they can uh, line up in a better way. Okay, then the next things we will do, we try to use the camera to capture the image. Okay, so the image then will send to the computer. Okay, and the computer will do the analysis. So in the computer, we will do the detecting and also classification of the bead. Uh, so that means we can classify them into the normal one or the uh, like a defect one. So that's the things we try to do for this particular one. But the reason we would like to focus on this one uh, is because for the, we know that Indonesia and also Vietnam are both one of the major uh, production place for the coffee bean. And we started this research to cooperate with uh, a South American country, Peru. And so we actually, when we look at the, the photo over here, this is what happened in some of the market. They, how they try to uh, pick up the defect. People just sit there and they line up and you can see the, a big chunk of the coffee bean in front of them. They just try to pick up the defect manually. So that's really tedious and exhaustive uh, work to do. And for the experienced worker, yes, they can do that very fast, but we know for some uh, people, actually the performance will uh, degrade over the time. So we are thinking, can, are we able to borrow the power of the artificial intelligence technique to help out to improve this kind of process? And over here, you can see the machine. This is the machine already in the market. But the market like this, they can process that, uh, we will say tons of the coffee bean per day. But the problem is they only separate the bean based on the color. So that means if, if your defect beans have a very similar color with the normal one, with the good one, then this kind of machine won't be able to separate them. And also the classification by this kind of uh, machine they only separate the bean, we will say in a binary way, good or bad. They were unable to separate them like or to identify what kind of defect they belong to, okay? And over here, I would like to show you, this is coming from the uh, coffee bean, we will say a so coffee association. They have a, a standard method for the classification. So in this part, you, you can see we have 13 major defects, okay? So some of them, their color are darker. Some of them, the color are just like the normal one. And some of them, they have an insect bite. Some of them, they are broken. Some of them, they have fungus, etc. So that makes the classification of different kind of defects of coffee bean become a very, uh, we will say, difficult task to do to do. So that gives us some uh, motivation to develop uh, some like uh, hardware, some machine, and also combine with the AI technique. And hopefully they can help us to improve the identification like this. And also we know that, for example, in Taiwan, uh, drinking coffee become a quite, we will say, for lots of people become a, a something they must do every day. The first thing in the morning, they need a cup of coffee to, to wake up, for example, okay? And some people that are really picky about what they drink. So that means they would like to, they are looking for those uh, very elite or we'll say very uh, high standard of the being. So that's another thing for those kind of uh, classification the coffee association actually, they have a very restrictive standard. 
So some of the defect cannot be tolerate in, for example, the, the top class, okay? And some of the defect they can still tolerate maybe for like one or less than 1% or 2%. So that give us another idea. Are we able to have this kind of machine to help out to classify in a better way? Because when the Peru, the expert in the Peru help us to prepare the sample, that actually, for for example, like 100, uh, we will say, gram of coffee bean, the experts still need probably around 10 to 15 minutes, or some of them even longer, like close to 20 minutes, to identify 100 gram bean, if they are the, what kind of defect they are, okay? It's very tedious, even for the experienced expert. So, after we have the bean from the Peru, then we find out the first question, first problem we are facing is we don't have enough example to uh, fit into the deep learning model to learn it. So that gives us the idea we need to produce more example. So that means, but how to do that, right? Um, so we actually try to use the data augmentation. So that means we try to fit the, uh, the real image we have into, uh, we actually use the GAN, that's one kind of a deep learning model, and try to generate very similar, but as fake image over here. So in this case, I'm showing you one kind of defect, so-called the shell. And we have two boxes over here, the red one for image on the red box. And we also have the four other image on the blue box over here. Actually, one of the group is the real image provided by Peru. And another group of image actually generated by our algorithm, the GAN algorithm. So I'm going to show you the answer. The left hand side, those are the real one. The right hand side, those are the one generated by our algorithm. So look at this. Before I tell you the answer, you probably will consider, oh, they look quite similar. So that's the power of the AI technique over here. You can see they keep the characteristic, the color, the shape, okay, for this type of the defect. So I'm going to show you a little bit more example another defect, sour. So you can see the color is more yellowish for this kind of defect. And once again, the left hand side is the real one. The right hand side is the one we generated through the AI technique. Another one, the broken one, okay? The chip or the cut, they have a, a different name but representing the same type of the defect. Again, this is quite interesting. The left hand side is actually the one we generate. The right hand side is the real one, okay? So we do have a pretty good outcome. So that means we got enough sample and to, for our, the next stage. So that means the next stage, we try to use the, another kind uh, of the AI technique. For example, like a CNN type of the, um, model to do it. We use like a Google Net or the Helen Net, Alex Net, those kind of uh, model to do it. And for the 13 uh, classes, and over here, this is the more like a confusion matrix to show our identification or classification result. So on average, our accuracy for the 13 different kind of defect actually is pretty high. It's like a 98%. And, but remember, this is only for the coffee bean from the Peru. But if our model try to apply the, this model to the bean from the different country, for example, from Indonesia, from Vietnam, will it work? Unfortunately, it may not work. Or actually, I should say, it definitely will not work as good as this one. Since the different kind of bean even the being from the same country, but from the different places, they look different, okay? 
So now we are still working on this project. We try to collect the bean from a different country. Now we already have the bean, thanks to some uh, like coffee company that one. We have the bean sample from, for example, Indonesia, and we have something from Ethiopia. We have the uh, Costa Rica, India, etc. I think we have around seven to eight country, the bean from the seven to eight different country and we try to build up the database. It's still an uh, ongoing project over here, okay? And this project actually was sponsored by the name Lenovo and also the Intel. And this is the uh, demonstration photo we show on the supercomputing conference uh, in uh, 2018 in Dallas. We actually carry, we ship all the, uh, prototype system and demo over there. So this is the photo we took on the booth. And the next one I would like to show you will be the infant or the baby crying recognition. And we know that the, um, for the caretaker, uh, some of them they can stay with the same room with the baby and some of them they cannot. Uh, so sometimes they actually try to uh, when the baby cried, they, they, uh, either they just run into to check out what happened or sometimes they just wait or maybe rely on some modern technology. But why baby cry? That different kind of reason, many different kind of reason. Maybe they're hungry, they need a diaper change, okay? Or they just feel like they're sleepy, they, they, they emotional need someone to pat in. Okay, lots of reason. Or another thing, maybe the sick, okay? Doesn't feel well, so the baby cry, okay? So there are many different kind of reason. So for this one, you can see, uh, later on you will see uh, why we consider this is also the AIoT, uh, we will say application, okay? So over here, I try to show you some like a commercial product I collect from the internet. So this two, basically the, the top one, they are able to collect the audio, the sound of the baby, okay? They're crying or uh, just uh, whining or something, okay? And the bottom one, besides the audio, they are also able to collect the video, filming, okay? And both of them, they, so those kind of product in the market, they are able to record it and also upload to the cloud. So the parents or caretaker, they can try to monitor, to watch those things through the internet. And so they can use their own cell phone. They can use their maybe like a PC, et cetera, laptop to, to watch it or to listen to. But we know there is no screening mechanism for the, the product in the market right now. So most of the time, when you get the notice from those devices, then you find out how could nothing happen. Maybe the baby just sleeping and maybe just have a, we'll say the bad dream or something, but not really have any like emergent need to be taken care. So give us the idea are we able to use the AI technique, those kind of things, so that we are able to create the, the product so that we can provide a screening of those audio, okay? So the first things, we have a product to collect. This product, actually, one of my PhD students who already graduated and working for the Rakuten, a Japanese uh, big company, e-commerce company. Uh, when he worked for his previous company, this is the product they developed, okay? So this one, they are able to collect the uh, crying uh, signal from the baby, okay? So this is the uh, actually how we collect it. We cooperate with the Far Eastern Memorial Hospital in New Taipei City in Taiwan. So we will put the monitor next to a baby. When the baby cry, then they will, the crying song will trigger the monitor. Then 
will start to collect the, the data. For example, for 10 seconds. Then after that, the nurses will help us to label what's the reason they consider. Uh, we consider nurses are more like expert in this area. So they will help us to label the, um, the crime. So th that means they will classify as this is like a, a diaper change, the baby is uh, as hungry, etc. Okay. And also when we collect the data, basically we are uh, pretty lucky. We have the chance to collect the baby one is for the particular for the group of the healthy baby, another group of the sick baby. So we are also have the chance to analyze the crying, the uh, correlation of the baby health condition with the, their crying signal, okay? So after that, after we collect the data, we will upload, we use the, this is the APP we develop. So the nurses, they can actually do the labeling and also all the audio will be uploaded to the cloud. And after that, we will do the data cleaning, pre-processing and using some AI technique to do the classification of the Christ. So this is a very typical AIoT technology. You can see we use this kind of uh, technology to collect the data, the IoT device. We uh, upload to the cloud. Then we use the AI technique for the analysis, okay? So the uh, algorithm we have applied for this particular application, including the uh, technique in machine learning, such as the ANN, decision tree, random forest, SVM, et cetera. And for the deep learning, we choose two of them, uh, CNN and like a long short-term memory, et cetera, to do it. I just show you some like uh, some of the, the result. We actually do lots of uh, analysis over here. So if today we try to classify whether the baby is healthy or sick, so it's like two uh, classes, we actually get very, very promising result over here. Like two deep learning methods, CMN, LSTM, they are able to get above like a 0.95 uh, for the precision accuracy or recall using the confusion matrix, very promising. But yes, uh, it's better than the machine learning technique. And we are still working on this part. Actually, we are now trying to use the uh, unsupervised learning uh, method to do it and see how well uh, happen. Okay, so this is also an ongoing project like this. So after I talk about the, my personal interest, then now I would like to spend some time to talk about our department. And also, uh, I will try to mention some of the project so you will understand even better what kind of project uh, our senior students have been working on for those AIoT tech uh, application. So, um, IEM department at YZU is one of the, uh, we will say the earth, the first five department when the YZU was established uh, 32 years ago, okay? And so you can see we have the bachelor program, we have the master program for the full-time and also the part-time student. Part-time student means they have another full-time job, but they also pursue the master degree and we have the PhD program. So we have quite complete uh, program in our department. And the number of alu alumni actually is, right now is close to like the over 4,000 already. And the number of students, right now we have around like 600 uh, students in the department, okay? And also I would like to share with you, I know about the whole like school, the YZU, and thanks to the Mr. Dipta, uh, already have a quite um, good introduction to that. But this part, I would like to focus on our department. So our department, we have very good number of international students. Since uh, we will say the past five years, uh, we have around 30 
on average, we have over 30 uh, international students in our department. Um, majority is the uh, graduate student, okay? Master or the PhD student. And over here, you can see that the student from the Indonesia actually become the top uh, one group in our department. Right now we have more than 10 uh, students from Indonesia. And also from the Vietnam, we also currently, we have three master students from Vietnam as well, okay? And the red one, those are from the uh, Central America or South America. That's another big group of our international students. And we have, uh, uh, our department also have the bonding from the university, several universities in Indonesia. For example, uh, like uh, your university, uh, the Atmajaya Indonesia. And also we have the uh, co uh, collaboration with the Atmajaya Jogakarta as well. And also in Jakarta area, we have the very close collaboration with UNTA, UBM and the Surabaya area, ITS and PCU or the uh, Surabaya, okay? And so you can see if you have the chance to uh, visit or join us, then you will see lots of uh, people from your country, okay? And our faculty member right now, we have 19 full-time faculty member and one chair professor, 10 full professor and four uh, associate and four assistant professor. We also have a, a junk professor from the Far Eastern Memorial Hospital. Okay, so that means uh, the application, as you can see, like a uh, infant crime recognition, that's a uh, application for the uh, medical, okay? And the logo in this slide, basically that's the logo from a different university where our faculty member get their uh, their PhD from. So uh, the 19, the full-time uh, faculty member, uh, what, uh, 17 of us had the degree, the PhD degree from United States, one from Japan and one from uh, British, from UK, okay? And the doctor over here, uh, she has the degree, the PhD degree, all the medical degree from the NTU, National Taiwan University. So we have pretty strong um, background for the faculty education background. And this is the things we are uh, for our department right now. The core is the small production. This is not just for the research of the faculty member, but also for our teaching curriculum. So for the courses, the core will be the smart production highly related to the in the, uh, industry 4.0. And also our students have the chance to learn like a mobile technology and cloud computing and global logistic management. So this part will be related to the supply chain management and big data analytics and the human factor engineering and design. So that will be the economics. We believe that will be a really important things for the IEM student now and the future. So for example, for our uh, graduate courses, okay, uh, our students have the chance to learn for the big data part, you can see on the left side, this one, our students have the chance to learn data visualization, machine vision, data mining, big data analytics, Actually, now we have two big data analytics class, one for the machine learning, another one for the deep learning, AI, uh, IoT, uh, heuristic optimization, blockchain, all those things. But of course, we know like statistic part is still important for our students, simulation, mathematical programming, uh, the DOE and network analysis, probabilistic analysis, et cetera, okay? And so our students have the chance, like graduate students, they have the chance to learn the different things. And we also have uh, several labs, okay? So the labs over here, you can see, depends on the equity of the, our professor. We also have something like business excellence, and we have something like a facility planning, and we have the e-enterprise production management, and also we have a very special, like a, particularly the teaching lab, 
okay, the AIoT lab. And actually, this summer we are expanding this lab, so we expect to have a very uh, pretty nice. Uh, so since it's still under construction, so maybe next time, uh, if I have the chance to introduce our department, we will have some photo to particularly uh, mention that one. This is the actually the current AIoT lab, but we are uh, double size of this lab. So we are pretty uh, exciting about that part. And some of the outcome from our uh, lab, like you can see the simulation, one of our faculty member, uh, uh, actually two, they're working for the simulation with one of the PCB company. Uh, that company actually is the, right now, the market share is number one in the world. We have very close uh, collaboration with them. So they are using the simulation tool to help them to build up the uh, factory and also production line, et cetera, even the warehouse, et cetera. And also we have pretty strong the machine vision part, okay, for the different application. And that's why you can see this is actually for the coffee bean. We are uh, some of the international students. So uh, before I introduce some of the senior project, I would like to quickly mention about the industry 4.0, nine major or novel technology introduced by, uh, into the industry 4.0 era, um, we can see what's the connection of those technology with the IEM student. Actually, I try to provide some of the software language. You might be, you might uh, hear before, you heard about those before. Okay, sorry. Let me go back to this one. Those actually are the tool uh, the our student have the chance to learn, okay? So I just sit then next to uh, the, we will say the key technology in for the industry 4.0. So for example, for the big data, okay, you have the chance to learn different kinds of things over here, Python, Minitab, R, MATLAB, et cetera. And for the augmented reality, for the 3D printing, for the cloud computing, and those are the database over here. Uh, SQL, MySQL, MongoDB. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm here. Mingwei. Hello. Hi. I'm here, Mingwei. I'm from Vietnam. Yeah. Should I continue or? Yes, you can continue for yourself. Okay. So I need to share the screen again, right? Let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, it is visible already. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, Besides the things I mentioned over here, I think those are quite important for our, uh, for the student for IEM. And those are the simulation. Mm, so can you see my screen? Yeah, sure, Professor. Yes, oh, we can. Yeah, yeah, right now it's okay. Yeah, because I, I actually have another laptop showing the, the YouTube and the live. Yeah, now it's all okay. It's normal now. Okay. And so for the Internet of Things or even for the simulation, we do have lots of tools in IE department to do it. Um, sorry, I think. Uh, uh, 
I think I'm seeing the screen from Vietnam right now. Yes, there is a screen from Vietnam. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, not me. So I guess I need to do it again. Okay, then I will quickly uh, wrap up the, my presentation over here. Can you see my, uh, the, I think the screen coming from Vietnam again. It's okay, Professor. Okay, then I will continue. Uh, Uh, I can. Okay. All right. I've removed the uh, person. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. You can continue, Professor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I will continue the presentation over here. So this is one of the senior project of or the capstone project our my, our student working on with the factory. So using this, they are able to collect the data from the factory. And also they try to use the uh, panorama photo so they can apply the AR VR uh, tool to do it. Okay, so that means, and they also try to combine with the data visualization tool. So the um, engineer, in the factory, they are able to supervise the things. Um, we will say the data, we will say the major reading, uh, maybe just from the control center, they can do it. So for example, over here, this is their power reading. Okay, so they can try to read the voltage, etc., and they can easily change which uh, reading they would like to see. But another thing quite interesting is over here, they provide, they embedded with the, um, we will say the data visualization tool is from the one of the big company typical. They have a smart fire uh, software. They already donate the software to our department. So our students have the chance to use it, to learn it and use it for free. And so they are able to no, not just the current reading, but also the time series data. So for example, you can control, you would like to know the reading for the past hour, the past like a few days or even past few weeks, depends on your definition. So that's something, another application that people can use, combine the IoT with the AR VR application for the factory monitoring and the training. The next thing is also one of the capstone uh, project uh, our students have done before. And with the company, they try to understand the cooling tower because the cooling tower, usually they have the senior technician to do the control of the cooling tower. But we know they also, they only based on their experience. But once the technician uh, retired, then the company have, will have difficulty to, to find someone uh, can follow up the control, have a better control of those cooling tower, which consume lots of energy. And also it's quite important, like uh, we will say part of the utility equipment for the factory. So our student try to develop an AIoT application for that one. So once again, they have the different kind of sensor to collect the data from the cooling tower. Then through the uh, IoT technique, the node red, they can send to the cloud and they actually store in the influx DB, the database. Then after that, they perform the big data and then they take the use some of the machine learning technique. And later on, they can recommend uh, how to control the cooling tower based on the environmental reading, okay? So this is actually the interface the project has provided 
So that means in the interface over here, you can see they have the cooling tower, they have the pump, and the green one means the in the alternative, they suggest to run the cooling tower number two, number four, and the pump as number three and number six. And also over here, and they can show you the temperature and also the efficiency. And for this interface they designed, they also are able to provide three different alternative. So the engineer, they can try to study the alternative and decide which one will be the best for them. Actually, the company already used this one and uh, they implement this one in their factory already. So we are very proud that our students have the chance to do that and to help out the company in their capstone uh, project. The final one I'm going to show you actually is also the capstone uh, project. They're trying to do the light controlling, okay, the street light controlling. And we know for the street light controlling right now, the, the factory actually, they have the timer or the switch to do it, but those actually are not very efficient way to do it. Okay, timer actually, for example, they will turn off the line like at the 6 a.m., they turn on the line at 6 p.m., something like that. Then we know that for the different weather, for the different season, this is not a very efficient way to do it. And for the switch over here, the photoelectric switch, basically they are outdoor, they put in outdoor and they are uh, actually, uh, they could be like a dusted and so become insensitive to the uh, the change, okay? So we are thinking, are we able to apply the IoT technique and AI technique to do a better control? So what do we do? Actually, in that factory, they have the solar panel, the power generation, and we know the solar panel system are very sensitive to uh, to the sun, okay? So that means to the things affect the, should we turn on the light or turn off the street light? Okay, so we actually use the data from their power, uh, the solar power panel. And also we try to collect the uh, weather data from our central weather bureau. Then we, th again, through the IoT technique, then we send those data to the database. And then after pre-processing, we use the Python to build up the AI technique to do it. Then after that, we are able to send to the controller group to better control the, uh, we will say the street line. And during this project, uh, our student actually also tried to use the data visualization tool to build up, to improve their dashboard so their engineer technician have a better uh, visualization on the control panel, okay? So this is the whole thing, another uh, application for the AIoT. So this is the actually the forecast they are using. They try to use the AMN artificial neural network, random forest to do it. And from here, you can see the red one is actually from the system. The blue one is the one we forecast. But our key issue is actually for this part. Because this actually is the critical things for turn on or turn off the light. Okay, so you can see the prediction actually is pretty good. So that means that we actually will convert to on and off decision in the second graph over here. Okay. So this one actually the factory also start to use this one for their uh, like a street line controller. Uh, we are pretty happy that also helped them to save some um, like a electricity better control. And also they are able to use this one to improve the safety as well. Okay. Then uh, to uh, finish my presentation here today, I'm going to uh, also try to show you that some activity that's particularly in our department. So those are the students, the international students in our uh, IEM department. We have the so-called IEM live back different festival. We will get it together. Like uh, you can see the Christmas and actually the two photo 
at the bottom, those are in the Indonesia festival. And we actually get together to celebrate. Yeah, it's actually lots of fun over here. And we uh, also have a different kind of like a scholarship, particularly for our uh, department, we have a government scholarship, so-called the ICB, particularly for the master's student. So if you are interested, you are welcome to contact me for more detail. Okay, so that will be all for my uh, presentation. And so if you have any question and you are welcome to contact me, thank you. So I will stop sharing and uh, give the control back to uh, the moderator. Thank you. All right, thank you, Professor Liang mm -hmm. for uh, the general lecture and also the introduction about the department mm -hmm. and um, about the explanation about um, all the programs and the software. And now we can start the question and answer session. All right, so uh, now we have a uh, some of the questions. Um, I will start from the general lecture first. All right. Uh, this one is for Professor Liang. Uh, what kind of software do you use for cleaning and processing the data? Example for the infant cry detection and the coffee bean um, detection. Um, that's, um, thanks for the good question. I think it depends on the application. For example, when we try to um, working on the coffee bean project, uh, that's actually the data is for the image. So we have to use the different kind of image uh, tool to do it. Um, some of them related to the machine vision, but when we work on the uh, infant crying and that the data actually become the audio. So the audio, actually, we try to use the different tools to clean up. Yes, the pre-processing of the data could be really, really time consuming. And like the one, if you remember the last uh, the project I shared, uh, that one is the street light controller. That one, the data we have is more like a, a numerical data. Okay, we have like a temperature, we have the humidity, we have like uh, some information from the solar panel system. So those are the numerical one. And so the cleanup will be a little bit different because sometimes we may have the missing value and how we have to make decision. Are we going to uh, try to put the value for those missing value or we just uh, remove them from the data? Okay, so I will say that highly depends on the application that we have to choose the proper tool to do it. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, thank you so uh, much, yeah. Professor Liang. And the second one is, what is uh, VAO benefits compared to other metaheuristic methods like genetic algorithm or B algorithm? And which kind of problems or characteristic that can be solved through this method? Does it have any uh, initial conditions? So, mm, thank, you. Mm. thank you, thank you. That's a, as I will say, which uh, this question actually reminds me uh, one of the question uh, when I had my PhD final defense, one of the committee member asked me some similar question. At that time, my dissertation topic was the uh, try to apply the ACO and colony optimization to optimization problem. So one of the committee member asked me, uh, can I summarize uh, what will be the proper area to apply the ACO? So this, uh, that's the, the common question we have been asked in the meta heuristic field. Yeah, so I will say depends on the uh, originality of the meta heuristic. For example, uh, PSO, VOA, uh, we actually, those kind of method, they were developed originally for the continuous optimization problem. And, but for like a ACO or like a taboo search, those kind of method that originally they were proposed to solve the combinatorial or discrete problem, okay? So the intention is a, a little bit different, but we know after the few years that people start to think, 
are we able to apply PSO to the conductorial optimization problem? Or are we able to apply ACO to the continuous optimization problem? Then people start to uh, propose the, we will say the variation of those meta heuristic for different kinds of problems. Some are um, pretty uh, successful, but some actually I will say fail, okay? So same thing for the VOA, when we try to propose the VOA, we also think about the same thing. Uh, we start with a continuous optimization problem. We have very good experience. For example, for the uh, power dispatching, that's a continuous optimization problem. For those benchmark function, they are continuous optimization problem. For the image things we were doing, we actually tried to do it in the uh, continuous optimization way. So they all were pretty nice. So later we are thinking, I am my student, the uh, host Wade, and we were thinking, are we able to um, apply the VOA to the combinatorial optimization problem? So we actually later develop a, a different version of the VOA for, uh, for example, like a TSP traveling salesman problem for the VRP vehicle routing problem. And those we know are famous uh, operations research problem in the combinatorial sense, okay? So if we try to do that, then definitely we have to modify the algorithm to make it work. And that sometimes could take some effort to do it, okay? So I will say if today you have a problem, you can look at the problem you have as a continuous one or a combinatorial one, then you try to, when you try to select the method, you can try to see the originality of those methods and see if you can start from there. I, I definitely recommend starting from there and, and that sometimes can save you some um, better time to do it. But again, like uh, right now we are able to apply VOA and PSO for both continuous and uh, combinatorial optimization problem. Okay, and same thing for the ACO. Now also some people, they try to apply the ACO to the continuous one as well, even though the, that kind of ACO is quite different from the original ACO, they change a lot, okay? So I, I, I will say, yes, it's possible. That's the reason we call those methods as the meta heuristic, because we hope that they can be applied to different kind of optimization method, not just limited to one type, okay? So I, I, I hope that I, I answered this question well, yeah. All right, thank you, Professor Liang. And uh, next up, we have um, more inquiries, uh, which is, um, before you mentioned about processing data using a uh, Python in the slides, right? And is it possible to process these kinds of data to other programming language? Oh. oh, yes, yes, yeah. The reason we choose Python is just because uh, we know uh, Python become the most popular language in AI. Uh, like uh, machine learning or the deep learning, because for example, one of the open source repository like uh, GitHub, GitHub you can find that people share their source code there and most of them are in Python. So that's one of the reason uh, we try to use Python, but of course that's not the only language you can use. If you are familiar with like uh, C, C++, C Sharp or Java, or um, you, you, are, you, you can do that too, yeah. But for the meta heuristic, I will say uh, if the CPU, the computational time is very critical to your problem, I will say the Python probably will not be a better choice than the C, C++, because C, C++, they can be more efficient in the computation uh, consideration. Yeah, so it really depends on your application and which language you are more familiar with. Yeah, so since uh, some of the application you see, we try to use the machine learning, deep learning tool. So that's the reason we are using the Python, okay. 
All right, thank you, Professor Liang. You're and welcome. next, we have a question about more about the information session. Uh, therefore, uh, Professor Liang and uh, Mr. Dipta maybe can answer this question. So, uh, there's an inquiry about um, if we are an international student, is it hard uh, to, uh, due to the language barrier, to communicate or to find ways to transport, etc.? Should I answer it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> For me, myself, I didn't find any kind of difficulty, actually. Right now, we are already living in the era where we have smartphone, right? And you can just install Google Translate in here, and everything can work really well while living in Taiwan. <laughs> uh, for me, myself, uh, in the campus itself, I don't have a problem uh, to speak using English. As you can, as you guys know, uh, the professor can speak English really well and much better than me. And then outside of the campus, uh, I can just uh, like using if it's hard. Uh, the people in Taiwan tendency will help you until you get what you want. So if you can speak, just use the Google Translate. They will help you until you get what do you want. So don't really you don't really need to think or care really much. Just try to do it and you will be able, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dita. And um, as a foreign student, do you feel it is hard to adapt in a new country? Mm, to be honest, uh, everything will be hard at first. But since uh, for me, myself, maybe because I'm a man and I'm, yeah, it's more easier rather than the goal maybe if you want to come or uh, outside of your own country but uh, actually as long as the environment uh, like supporting you to develop and to joining into the community I think nothing's hard actually <laughs> and for me myself like you know see this is my life uh, and right here I'm the only foreigner in this department the only foreigner in this department. And so far, if I feel it's hard to talk with them, I'm just using this Google Translate as my tools. <laughs> so it's not really hard for me. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. And Actually, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Actually, I see our another speaker from Vietnam. Yeah, from uh, Ben is here. Yeah, I, I, I saw his name. Maybe we can ask his... <laughs> Oh, yeah. Experience too. Yeah. Maybe, Ben, what do you think? Is that hard for you to adapt to living in here in Taiwan? Is he here? Still here? Yeah, I believe he's still here. He was here, but now. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, he, he already left, maybe. Oh, uh, uh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, and then there's another inquiry about, is it mandatory to, for students to stay in the dorm or is there any other choices? Uh, for, from what I know, if you are going to joining the IEM or the industrial engineering, if you got the ICDF scholarship, it is a mandatory to stay in the dormitory because they already paid your uh, dormitory. But for us, who just got the scholarship like MOE or uh, MOE, what I mean from the Minister of Education or from the YZU itself, you can choose. But if you want to stay here in dormitory or outside, mm -hmm. me, myself, I stayed outside of the dormitory. So it's not a mandatory, actually, except with exception if you get the ICDF uh, scholarship, because it will be a wasteful if you didn't take the opportunity because it's a free <laughs> like free room and you didn't take it it's, it's a waste <laughs> yeah. so it depends on you yeah all right thank you and um you mentioned about like uh, we we can have a body system where mm. uh international student can have like their own mentor or body <laughs> and mm. could you tell us more about it so uh, later on, when you are already registered or some, uh, being the new student here in Yuanzi University, usually we will have like a welcome party first. 
at that welcome party, all the foreigners will gather around, and sometimes they will like invite the local student and some of the other senior local uh, foreigners to join the event. And right there, you will they will like uh, giving you the chance, the opportunity, like to build up your own connection, and you can just uh, find out who will become your mentor right there. And yeah, you can choose it by yourself who will be your mentor. But usually the people from like you guys, if you guys from the Indonesia, you guys for sure will find out easier because in here, the Indonesian student have the Indonesian Student Association. So we will be the responsible. If you guys will come, we will help you starting from getting everything or no need to worry the to adapt on everything, we will help you to get everything that you need. All right, that's great. And uh, next, after you mentioned about uh, there's like an Indonesian community, is there any community or like an um, extracurricular activities uh, based on our passion? Uh, there is, but the problem is that you need to learn the language first. Uh, but actually, uh, the GAO or Global Affairs Office already prepare, uh, already having the Global Student Association. And usually, the Global Student Association will try to provide the best uh, way for you guys to join the extracurricular. So you guys know it. Or if you can, you still can. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Dita. And uh, you mentioned about uh, we, we are mandatory to learn about programming language in uh, in the courses. And is it hard for those who don't have any uh, programming background? Uh, for those who are going to take the master's degree, I don't think it's going to be easier if you don't have the background before. Uh, but all the students in here will help you to start even from the scratch. I believe in even in the IEM, some of my friends from Indonesia didn't have a programming mm -hmm. language background and they uh, come to us and asking to, and we will uh, like to help you guys uh, to provide a better way to learn it too. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think for this part, actually you can find lots of resource on the internet as well. Yeah, yeah, to learn the, the programming. Yeah. So yeah, don't really have to worry about that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can ask the professor too. <laughs> for the <laughs> advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Dita and uh, Professor Liang. And next we have a question about uh, what are like the interesting facilities or like yeah the benefits for students um, when we experience studying in YZU. For professor, right? Or it's for me or for you you can try. It. Yeah, yeah. You, you can try to see. I'm not sure uh, but for me myself from my experience I get a lot of uh, benefit from studying here in YZU. Because not like the maybe not like the others, I am quite lucky to get almost everything in here. Like I got the scholarship stipend. I'm able to being the TA. Uh, I mean teaching assistant, uh, research assistant. Even I'm still a master student. <laughs> so, and I'm get the part time job <laughs> at GAO. It's like uh, a lot of benefit that I get while studying in here, and I feel. The experience is quite wonderful for me myself, but it depends on the person too. I think if you want to try and you try to get it, I believe it will become a good experience for you yeah. guys too. Yeah, it, exactly. And also besides like uh, the chance uh, Dipta just mentioned, I think for example, some of the professor, they have the uh, industry project or the MOST project. Yeah, for the graduate student, they are welcome to join as well. Yeah, if you, you would like to join, then you can discuss with your professor. Um, not only you will get some extra, we will say pocket money from the, the project, but you can also learn a lot from there. Like in my lab, laboratory, I have a, a PhD student from Indonesia as well. Um, she actually graduated from UNTAR 
and she got the master's degree and now pursuing the PhD degree. And so she's working on uh, for one of the company's project uh, with one of our, co uh, we will say the Far Eastern um, company that that's one of the biggest company in Taiwan. So I, I believe she should learn a lot from that experience. Yeah, that definitely will be really, really something beneficial to, to your future and to many things, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Professor Hello. Liang. All right, Pa Ronald wants uh, to- Professor Liang, yes. I, I have uh, one question for you. Sure. About mm -hmm. the opportunity for our students mm -hmm. to like a student exchange in your university, not a degree, but a student exchange. Sure. Is it possible? Mm -hmm. And maybe also if uh, our students are interested to have like a capstone project. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, uh, your, maybe in your lab, the, the equipment is more uh, complete or others. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for our students uh, for one semester or three months uh, mm -hmm. go to uh, your university and doing uh, some project with one. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes. Um, before the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we do have some exchange students from the different country. For example, we have some uh, students from Sweden, the Linkshop University. Mm -hmm. Actually, right before the pandemic, I think we, at that time we have seven from Sweden. Yeah, so they come here, some of them stay for one semester, some of them stay for one year for as the exchange student. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's definitely welcome. Yeah, also for the capstone, yes. Capstone project. Uh, oh, yeah. How is the procedure? I mean, uh, like uh, uh, the student have to pay for something or? Oh, uh, depends on, I will say depends on the MOU and we have some quota for each uh, university. So that means some of the students when they come, uh, they don't have to pay the tuition. They got the tuition way. So that, that really depends on the MOU. Yeah, we need to check out. Maybe, for example, like uh, we have maybe like three students each semester from Atmat Jaya. They can get the tuition waive. But if we have more students would like to come, then some of them may have to pay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that depends on the MOU. So I just think, our students just uh, pay for the daily life daily like mm -hmm. expenses mm -hmm. and for the tuition mm -hmm. is free I think that is. yes yeah okay. but they can but they can also take courses also take a courses okay yes, they can take so for free yeah yes yeah if yes. they got a tuition wave then they uh, whatever courses they took they, they don't have to pay extra yeah mm -hmm. okay yes. thank you mm -hmm. maybe uh students have you any questions about this one, but uh, this is an exchange or maybe a capstone project for next next semester, maybe next year, yeah, next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for next year. We hope the pandemic will offer that. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah. I really like to visit uh, Indonesia again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to be there in July, actually. <laughs> <laughs> For the conference, yeah, yeah. Or you, the uh, student can email me afterward if they have any question. Yeah, they're always welcome. Yeah. And for the student, if you guys still want to ask about the information about Yuanzi University, you can find me in the website. My contact in the GAO website or in Yuanzi University website too. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dita and Professor Liang. Um, could you possibly give encouragement for students who is interested in these international opportunities, um, like giving like encouragement for them to go abroad? Hmm. Um, I think it take yeah, definitely some courage to to do this. For example, for myself, I have my bachelor degree in Taiwan. But after that, I decided, actually, when I studied in undergrad, I already decided I'm going to pursue the uh, graduate 
a degree in United States. So I prepare myself to do it and I make the movement and I still feel grateful. I, I think that very happy to, to make such a movement because you found a different uh, university, different side, I see something different. I don't know which one is better or like that, but it's a definitely unique and new experience. I learned a lot by doing that, okay? And you don't have to get yeah, differently. You, you probably feel, oh, I, I will be away from my family and can I do that? Think about this, when I uh, studied in United States, that was 20 something years ago, and you know my age now. And so that at that time, we don't have the internet meeting. The only thing we can do is like uh, to make a very expensive phone call. When I say expensive, so that means we can probably only talk to our family like once a week for like uh, 20 minutes at most because the phone bill will be very expensive. And now you can see, we, we have the conco like this one. You can see your family anytime you want to talk to them, your friend. That would be much, much easier for the student who would like to study abroad. Yeah. And that will be definitely some, will say something change your the whole life. Yeah, very unique. Yeah. Don't worry, just be brave. <laughs> make a, such a movement for this uh, student exchange. That would be great too. Yeah, that definitely something uh, that should do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, like Professor Liang before, uh, I'm already living in Indonesia for quite a long time too, right? Before, for my bachelor, I did it in Germany before. So, it's quite a long time too for me. <laughs> I back to Indonesia. Mm. Uh, yeah, as you can see, you need to be brave first uh, to make the decision mm. for sure. Because at that time, me myself think uh, have a lot of fear uh, to take the really first step to get out from the uh, my own country and thinking like I'm going to really far away from my family and everything. But after some uh, decision, I got a lot of things from it. Uh, even right now, I got the chance uh, to go back to Indonesia and become a lecturer to Indonesia. That's one of the things that I never think about it. So uh, if I may state it in uh, my own language or in Indonesian language, I'm really sorry, Prof. Uh, Janganlah kita jadi katak dalam tempurung. Uh, banyak hal yang bisa kita lihat dari luar dan coba ambil langkah pertama kalian. Kalau kalian rasa itu yang terbaik untuk kalian, coba lakukan. Try to do it and you will see the result. All right, thank you, uh, Miss Ludita and Professor Liang. Uh, Miss Lianto, do you have any inquiries? All right, Mr. Yanto, you are on mute. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So it's clear. I, I have no nothing to to question Dr. Liang or Professor Liang. So I hope that our student learn something from the presentation and they take this opportunity to go overseas in, in particular in, in Taiwan. Thank you very much. And in addition, uh, in our department, most of us now, uh, we call that MIT, yeah? uh, made in Taiwan. <laughs> Our, we have a fourth doctor degree from Taiwan will be. Thank you. Okay, Bianca. Okay, thank you. Sorry. All right, thank you, Mr. Yanto. And um, I think uh, the questions are already answered. And on behalf of Indonesia Engineering Department of Atmajaya Catholic University of Indonesia, 
uh, we thank you all for making time to join us here today and we're sorry if there's any inconvenience and um, we hope that there will be more opportunities in the future and also collaborations and I wish you all a pleasant day. Okay, thank you. Professor Liang, thank you. Tita, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye.